Well, if you could find your place in Matthew, you'll be uh, at the end of chapter 8 and the beginning of chapter 9. These two chapters together have an interesting theme, just the two of them, on the heels of the Sermon on the Mount. And today we find ourselves kind of talking about the authority of Jesus. So that's an interesting subject. And so I thought maybe it would be helpful for us to think about maybe moments in our own lives when we have been under authority. And that could be school, it could be work, it could be sitting on the side of the road looking in your rearview mirror and seeing blue lights, you know, authority in your life. And here's one thing that's a truth. All authority in your life is not good. It, theoretically, it should be, but it's not always good. Not everybody has good, godly parents that produce a good, godly home environment. Not everybody has a good or godly boss at work that produces a good healthy work environment. Not every police officer is good and godly and produces a good interaction when you're pulled over on the side of the road. Um, You can think about times in your own lives where you're probably thinking of it right now. Well, I remember this job I had and I remember this boss and it was terrible. Or I remember this part of my childhood it was was not good. And, and those moments in your lives, while painful and unfortunate, can also then help you have a better comparison to say, when I see good, uh, good leadership and good authority, I can recognize it because I know what it looks like when it's bad. And so I, I can recognize good and godly leadership. Part of that comes from Uh, That comparison, good versus bad, part of that comes from whether or not that authority is earned or just handed out and given. And sometimes when people get put in a place of authority that they've not worked for and they've not earned to get there, sometimes that's uh, a quicker route for it to go to their head and all of a sudden uh, they're just on this little power trip and they want to treat everybody a certain way. And that's not real authority, that's not real leadership that's unfortunate uh, positional authority. Yeah, I heard a long time ago that if, uh, if you have to constantly remind everybody that you're the leader, then you're not really the leader. And if you're too far out in front of those that you're supposed to be leading, you're not really leading, you're just out taking a walk by yourself. Leadership, authority, that's an interesting dynamic. Thankfully for us, Jesus got it completely right. And it's a good example for us to follow. So today we're going to read from Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 28, to Matthew chapter 9, ending in verse 8. Two paragraphs, two stories, uh, both of which will probably be somewhat familiar, one maybe more than the other. But they each teach us a particular truth about who Jesus is. I'm going to start reading in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. The words will be on the screen for you. And when he came to the other side, into the country of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. And they cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance from them. The demons began to entreat him, saying, If you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. And they came out and went into the swine, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the waters. And the herdsmen ran away. And went to the city and reported everything, including what had happened to the demoniacs. 
And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they implored him to leave their region. Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea and came to his own city. And they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes said to themselves, This fellow blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven, or to say get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to, give, to forgive sins, then he said to the paralytic, Get up, pick up your bed and go home. And he got up and went home. But when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to men. Father, I pray that you'll take this word we've read. I pray that you would open up our hearts and minds, help us understand, and then help us be obedient. For your glory and our good, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a, a very interesting set of stories because Jesus has authority and we we need to understand what that looks like but sometimes it's not so easy to really get at the heart of the matter these stories help us understand different aspects of what Jesus is able to do his prerogative as son of God as second person of the Trinity God himself and the more we read the more we start to realize the people around they didn't really get it you know, as, a, as a whole. Some understood on some level, but most of the people that Jesus encountered in His earthly ministry, they just didn't really understand, this is God standing here in front of you. This is the Messiah sent from heaven. This is not an ordinary man. This is not an ordinary prophet. This is not some religious leader like you're used to seeing. It's not who Jesus is. He is unique, totally different and distinct from everyone they've ever met. And so today, we get to see a couple of very important aspects of Jesus and His authority. The first one is this. Jesus has authority over evil. And this is probably one of the most significant things that we need to file away and keep in our minds and our hearts and remember because guess what we all encounter every day in varying degrees? Evil. Every single day. Spiritual attacks abound all the time in everybody's life, in everybody's experiences. If you don't think you are being spiritually attacked on a given day, then you're not paying attention. It's just that simple. Everything, let me, let me try to describe it this way. We don't have compartments in our lives. I don't have my home life, my work life, my family life, and, and so on down there. That's not, everything is spiritual. And the sooner we understand that and embrace that truth, the better off we will be and more equipped we will be to deal with all the nonsense we encounter. Everything is spiritual. You don't have a spiritual life that you keep over here and you only bring it out on Sundays and the occasional Wednesday. That's not, oh, well, in Bible school, you know, the extra days, you get extra God points for Bible school. So y'all go and mark it down Monday through Friday. Extra gold star on the chart, right? It's not how it works. Your whole life is spiritual in nature. Your whole life. And the sooner we understand that, the sooner we will be able to appropriate this authority and, and power that Jesus has and that He is willing to use on our behalf if we'll just pay attention. You understand what I'm saying? When we encounter evil, is there anything Jesus can't do? Is there any enemy that's too great for him? Is there any problem we might encounter in our lives that's out of his league? No. So here's the obvious question. Why do we wait so long to run to him for help? Why do we wallow around in our own incapability and our helplessness when Jesus is... The master of the universe. 
why, why don't we run to Him if He's able, if He's all-powerful, and He knows our struggle? Jesus has authority over evil. In this particular case, there are parallel passages for each of these. Um, so this particular paragraph, at the end of chapter 8, you could also go to Mark chapter 5 at the beginning. Mark 5, 1 through 20. And you'll see this story. Also in Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 26, same account. Interesting uh, comparison here. Both Mark and Luke have much more detailed accounts than this one. And also, both Mark and Luke mention only one demon-possessed man. And both Mark and Luke describe the demon in question as legion. For there are many, many of them. So, here's the, the huge... I, I don't want to belabor this. There's a lot of things that we could really um, dissect in this paragraph and bring out. But here is the... The golden nugget in this paragraph that everybody needs to pay very close attention to. You ready? We need to make the observations about the demons. If we want to really have this driven home for us, observe the demons. Here's what we can read in the text. If you, if you look, beginning in, say, verse 29... And down to verse 32. The, those four verses in the middle here. Here's the observations we can, that we can make about these demons. Ready? They are extremely violent. They knew exactly who Jesus was and is and will be. They called Him the Son of God. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. They knew exactly what the future held for them. They knew about their torment. They asked about it. It's right there in the text. And keep in mind, this is the least detailed account of the three. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And still we see all this really, really important information. Number four... They knew Jesus had complete authority over them. They asked permission for where they could go. Don't miss that. And the fifth observation I made reading this text is in verse 32. Demonic forces cause death and destruction everywhere they go. Now, if, if those are the observations that we can make just from a quick reading of this text, I want to kind of go a little deeper into a few of these. Because we're trying to learn what we need to do with this Scripture, right? Whenever you read the Bible, here's what I want to know and I suspect you want to know. Okay, I, I want to understand it, but here's what I need to know. What do I do with that? How do I take that Scripture right there and how can I incorporate it into my life where I can live more for Jesus? I want to live more like Jesus wants me to based on that, right? That's what we want. Okay, well, let's look at these middle three observations about these demons. They knew exactly who Jesus was, who Jesus is, and who Jesus will be. They called Him the Son of God. How well do we know Jesus? Because I'm reading a story in Matthew chapter 8 that tells me the demons, the eternally condemned demons, know exactly who Jesus is. How many times have you encountered anybody just in your daily routine or at work or wherever that doesn't know Jesus and doesn't know who Jesus is? The demons know who Jesus is. And here, here's the sad part. Sometimes I get the feeling that the demons know Jesus better than some Christians. Now how does that make us feel? Not too good. They know exactly who He is. 
and they know that there's nothing in common. They say, what do you have to do with us, Son of God? And they know their future. The next observation. They know their future. They know that they're going to be, they're destined for a future of torment. And they ask Jesus, are you here? Look, look, look at what he says. Look at what these demons say to him in verse 29 at the end. Have you come here to torment us before the time? So they know it's coming. They know what's going to happen. They know how the they know how the story ends. Did you see that? They know what revelation teaches us. These demons. They know there's a time coming for them that will be torment eternally. And they just want to know it, it's not time yet. What are you doing here? They're afraid. Okay? They're afraid. So what do we take from that? What is the eternal destiny for those who reject Christ and the gospel? It's torment. You, you'll be standing beside the, the demons being tormented. That's the destiny for those who reject Christ. They knew Jesus had complete authority over them. They needed His permission. When they see this herd of pigs feeding a distance away, verse 31 says, they began to entreat Him. You know what an entreaty means? It means um, it's a request made from a subordinate to a superior. That, that's what's going on here. They, there is no doubt in the minds of, of these demons who's in charge here. They know Jesus is the one who is all in charge of all things. And they say, well, if, if you're going to cast us out, because they know what's coming, they know who He is, send us into the herd of pigs. They're, they're asking for permission. And with just one word, Jesus says, go. He gives them permission to not be thrown out, some, commenta some commentators would say, th just thrown out into the abyss, just wait, the nothingness waiting until their time of torment. But he sends them into the pigs. What is the immediate result of that? The whole herd down the steep bank into the water to their deaths. Because what do we know about evil, demonic forces? They cause death and destruction. That's what they're doing. It may be slow, it may be immediate, but that's the goal. Death and destruction. So here's the interesting insight from the way Jesus dealt with this situation and the way the people in the town dealt with the situation. This is important. See, Jesus cared more about the demon-possessed men than He did about the pigs. But if you read the end of the story, verse 32, I mean 33 and 34, when, all the, when the herdsmen run into town and tell them what happened, Two things that, that are of note here. In verse 33, look how it's described. It says the herdsmen ran away, went into the city and reported everything. Now you would think that'd be enough, right? Everything. But look at, look at the addition at the end. Including what happened to the demoniacs. So it's like what happened to the two guys was just an extra. They want to know about the pigs. What happened to our livestock? Oh, but also these two guys, they're okay. Not that anybody cared, but they're fine. Jesus cared more about the men than he did the pigs. But it appears the people in the city cared more about the pigs than they did the men. So, so what do we take from that? What are our priorities in how we interact with those around us? Do we care more about things than we do about people? How do we value those around us, those who have needs, those who have uh, challenges we're trying to, to pray for or help them through? Where's our priority list as far as what we care about? Because here, very clearly, the people were all concerned about their economic loss. They were concerned about what happened to the pigs. And they said, oh, and by the way, uh, these two guys, they're fine. Because you know what Mark and Luke say in their accounts? After this happened, it says that the demon-possessed man was now sitting there calmly dressed 
and in his right mind. So it gives attention to the state of the individual, not just what happened to where the demons went. And the men also wanted to follow Jesus when he was leaving. And he told them, no, you go to your own home and tell everybody what I did for you. Be a witness of your transformation. Hello, what are we supposed to do in our lives? We're supposed to tell somebody about what Jesus has done for us. Has Jesus made a change in your life at all? I'm assuming you're just thinking about that by the silence. I'm just assuming you're just pondering the answer to that question. Because once you arrive at the answer, it ought to motivate us. I need to tell somebody about this. This is pretty significant in my life. My life has changed completely because of Jesus, and somebody needs to know about that. I've got family members who need to know that Jesus can make a change in your life. I w- just to, to identify, I was about to say, I've got co-workers, but I was like, no, I'm not, I, my, co- my co-workers, they're good. I'm not, I'm not talking about they need to know Jesus. That would have been bad. You have to remember where you work sometimes. <laughs> Leon Morris wrote a really interesting thing about uh, this first paragraph. He said, it might have been expected that the the people in the city would want to welcome the man who had power over the demons who had brought such spectacular unexpected deliverance to the demon possessed in their own area but this was not the case they were evidently more concerned with their economic loss and this brought to light the real values of the local people they valued their pigs more than the healing of the men and their request was that Jesus lead them and it makes it plain they would rather live on a lower level than the one Jesus was opening up before them. Now, I don't want to. I don't want to be better off and have to change my way of life. I'd rather just kind of just stay how I am. That's fine. I'm just gonna fiddle around, you know, herding these pigs, and not worry about my life or the lives of those around me. But as soon as we understand that Jesus has authority over evil, I would think our first course of action would be, you know, when I'm getting attacked spiritually, when I feel like all these outside forces are bearing down on me, I'm going to make a note. First thing on my list is I'm going to go run and talk to Jesus because I know He can handle it. And He will. And it will always be better than had He not been involved. Jesus has authority over evil. But the second thing that we see here is Jesus has authority over sin and sickness. Jesus has authority over sin and sickness. These parallels here for for this part of chapter 9 is Mark chapter 2 and Luke chapter 5. Oddly enough, two weeks ago on Wednesday night, we looked at the Luke passage that is a parallel to this one, which was kind of interesting. So, Jesus is going to demonstrate authority over sin and sickness. So, uh, in the parallel passages about this paralytic who gets healed, both Mark and Luke mention that he's lowered down through the roof of a house. And Matthew does not mention that. Matthew, again, is less detailed about this. And here's one thing we should maybe think about. What's Matthew's purpose? Who is his audience? He's writing to a Jewish audience. His main purpose in the gospel, as he's inspired to write these things, is all about proving, demonstrating, showing that Jesus really is the long-awaited Messiah. Because the Jews didn't believe that. And so he's showing. That's why he's constantly quoting the Old Testament. He's constantly showing the connection and saying, look, this, this one here, this is the one you're looking for. It's him. And so he is a little less detailed here. David Turner wrote something really interesting about this healing. He said, This incident demonstrates the most crucial part or the crucial aspect of Jesus' authority, and that is the forgiveness of sins. Authority to forgive sins is much greater than authoritative words and actions since it gets to the root of the problems and the illnesses that are symptoms of sin. So this miracle of healing takes place in Capernaum, not Nazareth. Verse 1 mentions 
his own city, talking about his uh, area of ministry, Capernaum. And Jesus, Jesus notices, he notices the faith of the four men who brought their friend to be healed. Here's another interesting thing. If you look at verse 2, Jesus says, Take courage, son. Your sons are your sons. Your sins are forgiven. Take courage, son. Your sins are forgiven. Interesting thing here is Matthew and Mark both use that same word, son. Luke uses the word for man. A little bit less of a, a compassionate feel. They're both the same result, though. And Jesus pronounces the paralyzed man his sins to be forgiven. So, why does he do that? When you look at verse 2 and you see what Jesus says, he sees the faith of the men who brought this paralyzed man, and he says, your sins are forgiven. So, what is Jesus doing right there? And why? There's a paralyzed man lying in front of him. What is the obvious need? He needs to walk. He's paralyzed, right? Jesus knows things we don't know. And so he does things in a way that we might not do. Jesus addresses the higher priority need first. What is the highest priority need we all have? I need my sins forgiven. I need to be right with God. So here's a paralyzed man who's brought by four of his friends on a mat and the first thing he says is not, oh, clearly you're paralyzed, let me heal that for you, stand up. He doesn't do that. He says, take courage, your sins are forgiven. Let me address your heart before we get to other things. In other words, um, you've got cancer, but I see you've got a little cut on your fingers. Let me get a band-aid and make sure that that's taken care of good, and then we'll talk about this other. That would be backwards, correct? What's the biggest, deepest need? The man needs forgiveness. And so Jesus deals with that first. He's planning to heal the physical need as well, but first things first. So then he allows the scribes and the religious leaders to have their little uh, mental party here where they're talking about uh, or thinking about all that Jesus has done, this man's blaspheming. And in Mark and Luke, they say to themselves, only God can forgive sins. What's this guy doing? So they're, they're right and wrong. You see that? Can only God forgive sins? Yes. But Jesus is God. So they, they, they didn't get that part. Right. So Jesus proves his point in a very emphatic manner. He says to them, hey, which is it easier to do? You say your sins are forgiven or say get up and walk? Anybody got proof that your sins are forgiven? Like visible physical proof? But if he says get up and walk, kind of hard to fake that, right? Yeah. So he can easily, safely say, oh, your sins are forgiven, and nobody can know for sure. But look what he said. Look at the phrasing of what Jesus is so direct. Verse 6. But so you'll know. I, I've taken care of it. It's done. But just so you'll know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he looks at the paralyzed man. Go ahead, get up and walk. Just, just show him. And up he goes. He gets up, grabs his bed, off to the house he goes. Glorifying God all the way. So what did Jesus just do? He demonstrated His authority over sin and sickness. He proves His point. He tells the paralyzed man to get up and He does exactly that. So the reaction of the people is priceless. All three of these gospel accounts use a little bit different phrasing. But the word Matthew uses in verse 8, my Bible translated it awestruck. You know what it literally says? They were afraid. 
Here's a man who just healed a paralyzed man and told him his sins were forgiven. That's not a normal man. That's not an ordinary person. And Jesus was anything but ordinary. Jesus is, was, will be always the Son of God. God in the flesh. The Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament. The Redeemer of all mankind. That's who Jesus is. He wasn't just a normal man. And, and so, we can't do everything Jesus can do. So why do you think it's so important to know Jesus? Because He can do things we can't do. And, and we need that. Matthew uses that word afraid. Mark uses the word amazed. Luke uses both of them. <laughs> Astonished and afraid. But Matthew is the only one of the three that mentions this word at the very end of our last verse. They glorified God who had given such authority to men. That word, authority. We're talking about the authority of Jesus. Let me read you a quote from Leon Morris. He says that the authority is given to men does not mean that any person can do what Jesus had just done. There's not the slightest indication that anyone in the crowd thought that. Rather, the thought is that God has been pleased not to keep the power in heaven, but to give it to people here on earth in and through Jesus. Why do we constantly feel so helpless when troubles cross our paths? How many of you ever, have ever thought this or said this? You've got a problem, something's going wrong, and you try to work it out yourself, you try to use whatever means are available to you to solve the problem, and then when those things don't work, ultimately, here's the thought. Well, I, nothing else I can do now but pray. Right? Anybody ever said that? I've said it. Anything wrong with that? <laughs> right? Um, kind of backwards. How about first thing? All right, before I do anything, let me pray. Let me talk to Jesus. Um, he's, he clearly knows what I'm struggling with he knows my need let me let me get in touch with him and get my agenda on his agenda and get my plan synced up with his plan so i don't mess up right wouldn't that make sense let me pray first instead of as a last resort folks if we know and understand and believe that jesus our savior our lord has authority over evil, has authority over sin, and, and authority over everything for that matter. If we really understand and believe that, why on earth would He not be number one priority whenever we have any kind of trouble? What are you struggling with in your life today? What's really loading you down with worry and stress? Have you talked to Jesus about it? Have you spent time in prayer? Have you shut your door and got alone and got on your knees with an open Bible and said, God, what do I do? I know you can work this out. I don't know how, and I don't know how it's going to look, how it's going to turn out, but I know you can do it. I have faith you can handle whatever I'm going through. So why are we not there? Why are we not on our knees in our room with the door closed and that Bible open? pleading with God. Instead, we're just wandering around on our own, not tapping into the most powerful resource known to man. Why would we do that to ourselves? Yet, that's the normal way. That's the normal human way of dealing with issues. I can handle it. 
You need help? No, I'm good. Why, why are we so... It's so hard for us to accept help from each other, let alone from Christ, who is totally able. He wants to help. He wants to care for you. He wants to forgive your sins. He doesn't want you dealing with things that are a result of a sinful world and a sinful human race that we were never intended to be dealing with. You know that, right? That's the, that's the intention of God. It was not to be burdened with sin. It was to be living in paradise, worshiping our Lord and Savior, and enjoying a beautiful, perfect creation. That's what we were intended for. And everything that's not that is just another step away from what God's design looked like for us. And we're not going to get back there if we continue to forsake the one source of of help we have. His name is Jesus. He has all authority. When we get to the end of Matthew's Gospel, sometime next year, uh, we're going to get to chapter 28 eventually. And when we get to verse 18, three verses from the end, do you know what Jesus Himself is going to remind us? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's who Jesus is. What's, what's stopping us? What's stopping us from running to Him every day, all the time, for every reason? That's where we need to be. He, he's, he's calling us to do that today. You got a problem? You have a concern? You have stress? You have an issue? Something going on in your life? Run to Jesus. Just, just run to Jesus. It's that simple. Let's pray.